Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And joining me from Los Angeles is Humble the Poet. And for my listeners who listen to me regularly, you can go back in my archives. And Humble has done a couple of other podcasts with us. Uh, he has many books. This book that we're going to be talking about today is called How to Be Loved. And the subtitle is Simple Truths for Going Easier on Yourself, Embracing Imperfection, and Loving Your Way to a Better Life. It's a Hay House book, by the way. So big shout out to Hay House. Love them. Uh, they're great to us. And uh, and I know that Humble was telling me we spoke. Uh, he had a wonderful experience uh, getting this authored through them. Um, Humble, I'm going to let my listeners know a tad bit about you before we dive into this interview. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a formal, former school teacher turned creative. Uh, what began as reciting spoken word poetry in coffee shops to impress girls evolved into a creative adventure that has now spanned 10 years crossing genres, mediums, and oceans. I'm now in an author, and he's an author of way more than one book. Uh, go look for him on Amazon. We'll put a link there. Hip-hop artist, speaker, designer, filmmaker, and creative consultant. Um, he admits he's made a lot of mistakes along the way, like we all do. Um, this is about being vulnerable. Actually, being loved is about being vulnerable. And um, Humble is very vulnerable in this book, expresses you know, what's happened in his life and things that he did and things that learned life lessons. And that's how we learn from one another. Uh, and I'm happy to share that. So humble, you know, we might as well start out in, oh, for my listeners, if you want to learn more about him, the homepage is shopping, is, is shop, he's got a shop, um, speaking, music, his new book, all of his books, his community, uh, just go humblethepoet.com. That's H-U-M-B-L-E-T-H-E-P-O-E-T.com. There you can learn more about Humble. Well, good morning to you, Humble. Good morning. Uh, blessings to you. Thank you for being on the show. And I'm going to dive right in because uh, if you tell our listeners a little a bit about yourself, I just told them a little bit, and but really why you wrote How to Be Loved. You have many predecessor books. Um that weren't exactly on love, right? Mm -hmm. But they've all been on personal growth in my estimation. Yeah. You mentioned that this book wasn't a labor of love, but a reminder that it's a labor to love. Yes. Um, I thought that was a, an interesting way to put it. So what is the labor to love? Um, I think a lot of popular ideas around love is that love is this prize that we have to win. And, and, and gain from other people um, or earn or be worthy enough of. And it's, it's just a reminder that love is the verb. You know, love is service, love is sacrifice. And um, love is the work. The work that we do, you know, can be inspired through love. And um, I remember so, uh, doing a podcast with Ram Das on love and devotion. And I guess my question for you would be around the word devotion, because I, during that podcast with him, um, it was quite enlightening, like the ones I've had with you. Mm -hmm. But those two words are used frequently together, love and devotion. What, what would you have to say about devotion? I think when it comes to devotion, you know, um, you know, the first word that springs to my mind is commitment. And, um, you know, a friend of mine, and which I included in the book, said, you know, honor your commitments, not your feelings. And I think the the, the repetitious element, the, the ritual element of, of honoring a commitment, you know, and understanding that we are only entitled to the labor, not the outcome of the labor. Mm -hmm. I think so often we think we're, we're destination oriented when we should really be focused on the journey. So for me, love is that journey. Um, and, and it's a committed journey. And that to me is devotion and understanding that, you know, our relationship is not only with other individuals, with ourselves and with the world around us, but it's also with love and having an unconditional love towards the idea of love um, and staying committed, you know, irrespective of how, you know, rocky the seas are um, as we sail them. Well, you know, humble, 
one of the things that I was listening to a podcast just a few days ago with uh, James uh, Timon, Timon. Um, and, you know, he talks about universal non-duality. Um, and for a lot of listeners, they understand they've heard duality before. But you speak with our listeners about the dualistic nature of thinking. You state that love is the experience beyond duality. Totally agree with you. But how can we move to this non-dualistic thinking that is unified as pure love? I think when we're younger and our brains are still developing, it's it's very easy to fall into the trap of dualistic thinking. Things are right, things are wrong, things are black, things are white. And um as we're young, it's you know, as I said, our brains haven't fully developed to kind of see the complexities of life. And the challenge with that is we make a lot of really important decisions of who we're going to be and establish certain habits of what directions we're going to go to when we're young <clears throat> without updating our software, without updating those policies as we get older, as our brains develop some more, and as we're able to see a lot of the gray in between the black and the white. Um, so for me, getting out of dual dualistic thinking is revisiting some of our old patterns, revisiting some of our old policies when it comes to how we handle life. And also approaching life with much more curiosity than judgment. You know, instead of looking at life as this is, oh, it rained outside. This is good or this is bad. Understanding that there's everything else in between as well. And um, opening up our mind to seeing the complexities of life and understanding that our judgments are what are denying us love from any moment or any situation. And to either reserve those judgments or surrender those judgments to allow things to be as they are. Um, as I'm taking a deeper dive into surrender, it's, it's, it's recognizing that things are happening irrespective of us and they're not happening to us. You know, they're either happening for us or they're just happening. And uh, we need to learn to realize that these things are as inconsequential to us as they've always been. Um, and the analogy I heard was, you know, we don't have an opinion on Saturn having rings. So let's not have an opinion on anything else. Life is happening. <laughs> things are things are developing. And oftentimes the reason we have these opinions and get into dualistic thinking is that it goes back and connects with some previous trauma that we've experienced in our life. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that uh, we you talk about, but at the same time, we know it's ego. And that's what splits people is just this ego. Speak, if you would, a minute about the actual ego when you're younger. And it says, would you rather be in love or would you rather be right? Mm. I heard that said many times. And what happens is that uh, I'm not just saying younger people, older people too, unless they've reprogrammed, right? They're mm. going to have this issue associated with the ego. And I kind of say, hey, the ego isn't going away, but you have to learn how to live with it. You have to learn how to, I'm not going to even say control it because that's not the right word. You have to coexist with this because it isn't going away yeah i, I view yeah i view ego as a as a, as a force of, of nature the same way i view gravity and you know it's only until we understand gravity can we learn to fly and i think it's the same thing where our egos um can serve as both fortresses to protect us but also prisons to keep us trapped in and i think what's really important is love is, is the phenomenon, you know, that we've all experienced that melts the ego. When you have love for someone else, you know, where you begin and they end, you know, starts to blur. And I think that's really important. And especially when we make choices, what we have to realize is when we're feeding our ego, we're taking ourselves almost in the exact opposite direction of love. So that earlier comment you brought up, I said, do you want to be in love or do you want to be right? Proving that we're right in an argument um, establishing our autonomy, establishing our power, establishing our control. You know, these are all languages of the ego. And the thing is the ego, the ego and love won't hold hands. You know, love is forgiveness. Love is service. Love is kindness. Love is sacrifice. And all of these are going to melt the ego. So it's really a question of what direction we want to head in and what experiences we want to have. So true. So true. And, you know, you stated that love is a path and not a destination. Um, that 
uh, frequently we're looking for love as if it was a secret in a secret hiding place someplace. You know, we're looking for love. People yeah. say that all the time. I need to look for love. Speak with the listeners about Robert Holden, the PhD term destination addiction and how it applies to love. I thought that was pretty fascinating. You, you pulled this term uh, destination addiction. Um, and how, do, how does this apply to love in your estimation? So I think, especially in, 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 in Western society, we think very linearly. So we, we think in terms of life having this beginning, middle and end, and we have to get to something. There's got to be a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I think destination addiction uh, is just that. It's thinking that there's a prize at the end of some sort of journey, um, not realizing that the journey is the prize. You know, the pot of the rainbow is the pot of gold. Um, and, and I come from Eastern philosophy, which is much more cyclical. So it's less about trying to get to any specific destination and instead just understanding where you are in a constantly repeating cycle. And I think that's really important because if we always focus on the end goal, then we lack appreciation for where we are. And it's really important to understand that, again, we're only entitled to the labor. We're only entitled to the journey. Where the journey takes us is not as important as what the journey does to us and who we become through going through this journey. So again, we watch movies, movies have, you know, endings or happily ever after. A lot of this contributes to our addiction to having this ending, this happy ending, um, this moment, but that's not what life is. You know, you graduate high school. Yeah, you finished high school, but you immediately go back to the bottom of the barrel and start a whole new experience in college or at your job. And now you're at the bottom and you climb your way up to the top. And then you're gonna start at the bottom somewhere else. And I think it's really important that we start to abandon this idea of these linear journeys that have endings and destinations and instead realize that, you know, we're in cycles. We have our we have seasons. We have our winter, fall, spring and summer. And when we look at life in that cyclical manner, um, we'll be able to be less judgmental of the things that are happening and as well embrace embrace the presence as it is. Well, you know, I was I, I was watching a Netflix documentary. Um, by I think it was uh, Joanna Hill with Phil Stutz. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they talked about in that documentary was um, this this concept of uh, pain, uncertainty, and work. Mm. Three things that they spoke about. And what you're talking about on the journey is really the work we're doing, the uncertainty there is, the pain that there is, right? Mm. Um the Buddha said there's pain and then there's the end or there's suffering and then there's the end of suffering. The end of suffering is that state of uh, our mind that we shift mm. um, to really recognize that as the fact. Do you, would you want to comment about the, the part about uncertainty, uh, about pain and about work along the way? You, you were talking about this as the journey, right? Not the destination. Mm. It's always about the journey. Personal growth is about the journey. Yeah, completely. And I think as well as as a society, you know, we are constantly sold more and more conveniences and more and more pleasures. And um, they are addicting. They're, you know, they're addicting to have someone bring your groceries to your front door, cook your meals, um, deliver your booze or whatever it may be. And, you know, everything at the in the palm of your hand now. The challenge with that is that it impacts our resilience. And when it impacts our resilience, that puts us into a certain world of mel melancholy in itself. And I think what we have to do is reestablish our relationship with discomfort. You know, we, if you look at the emotion wheel of the types of emotions humans can feel, you know, over 70% of them would be deemed negative, but that is how we survived. That's how we thrive. You know, you don't learn much when you're happy. You know, you learn through the unpleasant emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have, it's not a good day at the gym if it was easy, you know, you need a challenge, you need resistance. And I think what we need to re realize is leaning into and going voluntarily into the unfamiliar, the uncomfortable, even the painful is the recipe of growth and the recipe of progress. And progress is really important for us to establish a stronger relationship with ourselves. Um, and so often what we don't realize is the goal here isn't comfort. The goal should be peace. And peace isn't having everything. Peace is not wanting anything. And I think that's a really important idea that we have to understand. And the big challenge is we, we, we've grown up in a society which is like buy stuff, be happy. 
buy all this stuff and that's going to make you happy. The more you have, the, the, the better you are. And it suddenly tells us that we are not enough as is, you know, as if there's. Well, oh, that's you that's what the merchandisers are all appealing to. Right. You know, when they're selling all of their goods yeah. and we live in a Western society, not an Eastern society. And in that Western society, it's been propagated by an economy that says you have to have more. Yeah. Um, and that economy is being driven and people are buying into that where I agree with you. Um, really less is more. It's yeah. it's like unpack your bags, right? Lighten the load. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember reading one time, and I'm sure you can um relate to this, that the average American, you know, when you saw these um uh what do you call them? The the temporary places where people store their shit. I'm just gonna mm-hmm. say that, right? Yeah, that that we have thousands and thousands of that the people have taken their shit out of their garage and moved it to one of those storage units because they didn't have enough room in their garage to store the shit and then they never go look at it they never do anything with it it just sits there in storage and so you keep thinking to yourself it's like wow kind of lighten the load it's it seems like it's a lot to carry around and it's heavy um and and so on this theme of love you know, you speak with us about Aubrey Marcus. He actually is my son's coach. So I, I know him well. Oh, amazing. And, and how he differentiates big L love and small L love. He states that small love gives us pleasure and B, big L love gives us peace, just like you just said a second ago. How do you recommend or uh, recognize the differences between the two for our listeners? I think it's important for us to, you know, create an anchor of peace. I think, you know, the first thing we have to do is, you know, go back and remember what it feels like to to have peace. I think so often um, pleasure gets so overwhelming that we don't realize that we're not even enhancing our lives with pleasure anymore. We're medicating our lack of peace. Um, So I think the important thing is to understand what brings you peace or what are some of these nutritious experiences that you've had or relationships that you had um, and for those who've had healthy family dynamics i think that's a great place to start when you think for big for big l love um, think about activities that you do that you don't care if anybody's watching that brings you joy and peace uh, i think those are important and also we're doing it gives you a level of satisfaction versus when you do the small l love stuff chasing pleasure pleasure is extremely temporary it's delicious but there's, there's no nutritional value to it and it has you chasing more. Um, and I kind of think about healthy eating versus fast food. And I think, you know, one is a lot more convenient and quick and cheap, but at the end of the day, you do it long enough, uh, it's going to eventually bite you in the ass. So I think it's really important to think of it from that standpoint. And I think as well as um, going back to the ego, you know, the small L stuff is what scratches and, and the, the itch of the ego. Uh, even though it's an insatiable itch Definitely. Uh, yeah versus you know the big l love uh there's another quote in the book that says you know small l love you know makes you feel smaller in a small world big l love makes you feel bigger in a big world um does your world feel bigger do you feel bigger in that big world i think that's a really good measurement right there for the types of activities and people we should be around yeah it- it happened yesterday. I actually, this is the time of year where I actually distribute a lot of my gift cards to the homeless. So I'm out on the streets with the homeless, uh, giving them the gift cards and doing my little interviews with them and so on. And, you know, you leave an incident like that, knowing that you're helping somebody to actually maybe get a meal, get something to eat, do something. It has so much more significance than chasing down pardon me for saying this, but, you know, another Christmas present somewhere, right? Uh, Because you're now reversed the gift. You know, you've got this gift of giving, this gift of giving. And the receipt is to see the faces of the people and understand what's going on and emotionally understand how somebody actually gets there, you know, actually ends up out on the street. And, uh, you know, just that is what I call the big L. Um, that's the way to be at peace because I left there with so much peace. You know, in your chapter on love attracts love, you speak about anxiety, worry, and uncertainty about love. Um, and we've all been there. You know, it's like people that get jealous. Uh, they, you know, it's a pretty common thing 
I think more among younger people than it is older people, but certainly younger people. How do we get rid of the unwanted emotions and realize the love in our life, regardless of whether or not somebody accepts us or not? In other words, hey, you got rejected. I've seen people do some pretty crazy things when they get rejected. Um, and what you got to realize is that you're the only one responsible. Nobody out there are, is responsible for giving you love. Nobody outside of you is responsible for giving you. But that's a hard one because people look at love as togetherness. They're saying, oh, well, I'm supposed to be together with this person. You know, that was the love of my life that I lost or whatever. And I get there's a tons of emotional pain at, pain at breakup. But how do you help people get rid of these unwanted emotions. I'm going to call them emotions uh, because then they're just sad and they're lonely and they're depressed and they're angry. And, you know, you can name every emotion that comes up, yeah. but that's what happens. I, I think the, the important thing is to, you know, not label them as unwanted, you know, emotions are all essential and necessary. And as I said, the vast majority of emotions a human can feel um, are would lean on the negative side. So I think other than happiness and surprise and surprise in itself can go both ways. Um, all the other emotions on a human emotion wheel would lean negative because that is what allows us to survive. Um, and I would also caution listeners to understand this. Most of the things that we chase um, thinking is love isn't love. You know, rejection just means, you know, that's the opposite of acceptance and validation. Acceptance and validation aren't love. That's acceptance and validation. These are facsimiles of love. Um, power, control, attraction, uh, attention, uh, status, success, you know, desire, all of these things have been related to love, but they're not love. You know, love, love is what is, exists when all these emotions are gone and all these experiences are gone. Now, you know, in these situations, you know, you always have a relationship with yourself and a relationship with somebody else. If I reach out to somebody and I want to connect with them and I'm rejected, you know, I can view their rejection as, you know, and I can take it extremely personal or I can, you know, view this as well as a moment of self-respect where, you know, I put myself out there and I took a risk, you know, nobody is promised to be accepted by everybody. Um, you know, even we don't accept everybody or, or, or love or like everybody in, in that capacity. And I think it's really important to understand that, that these emotions aren't you know, things that we need to avoid. If you work in sales, the first thing they're going to get you to do is learn to have a healthier relationship with rejection. Understanding that rejection isn't about you. It's the other right. person's story. You right. know, somebody somebody tries to sell me a dishwasher and I don't need a dishwasher. <laughs> that, that's no reflection on them or their dishwasher. <laughs> right. That's not where I am in my life. And the thing but, is in really a non, but in a non-dualistic world, um, non -dualistic world it, yeah. it, it, let, let's go back and visit that for a second. We're talking about these dualities now again um but in that non-dualistic world uh humble what is supposed to happen okay is this purity of unconditional love we are all one mm. we're together mm -hmm. so when you look at them out over the masses you know i was just i was just flying and here i am in airport terminals and i'm in waiting in queues and i'm all over when you look out at the people and you really look at it with unconditional love that we're, hey, we're all in this together, trying to get on this plane. There's no reason to get upset. There's no reason to be in a hurry. There's no reason to do any of that. Yet there's this something inside of you frequently that spins up and says, you know, I got to go to the front of the line, you know, and uh, you, you get what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because there is no peace in that. Yeah. You know, there is no peace in that just period there isn't yeah. there's anxiety in it there's yeah. worry there's yeah. frustration yeah. how do you tell people or at least inform them or because you know you're looking right now as as you know in your philosophy to find a world of peace yeah um i see your sign behind you freedom is having nothing to lose yeah you know but everybody thinks they're going to lose something if they don't get in line up front of somebody. Yeah. Okay. Cause we're going to run out of something and yeah. it's this scarcity mentality. There yeah. aren't enough people. There isn't enough of this. There's not enough of anything. So yeah. if I don't hurry up and get my enough, then I'm going to run out. 
Yeah. Right. And I, and I think it's about acknowledging these, these apparatuses and, and, and systems that have been developed for that. You know, I think it's important to understand that a lot of causes of our dis-ease is believing that we, we live in a universe of one. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that in a positive sense. I mean, the sense that we are the center of this universe and mm-hmm. nothing else matters. And then you go to the airport and not only, you know, do you have this urge to be at the front of the line, they'll also say, well, if you're in a certain socioeconomic standpoint, you can afford to get to the front of the line. You know, it's it's, it doesn't, it's not a meritocracy who got there first. It's about who can pay the most. And, you know, and, and that decides if you get to have a meal on your flight. That gets to decide if, you're, if you're, your chair has a little bit more cushioning. That decides how many people you have to coexist with. And I think it's, it's a really interesting standpoint because it goes back to how the society is being developed and how unnatural that is, you know, because what that does is that encourages us to become almost robotic in the sense of our productivity we got to be on like we're computers all of a sudden when no other animal in, on, on earth you know operates in that capacity they feed themselves in sprints they don't feed themselves in endless productivity and i think it's really important that we recognize that and a lot of these things that we're talking about are going to feed the ego you know yes. this uh who are these people why are they encroaching in my space <laughs> yeah. and yes. love is helping us understand that listen we are made of the exact, from a scientific standpoint, we are made up of the exact same atoms as the stars and the sun and everything else on earth. We are, we are no different. We are no more special. And, you know, there's a beauty in that because that makes us nothing and everything. Our egos are what separates the drop that we are from the rest of the ocean. And these rare moments where we can experience that that membrane melting, that separation melting, that border melting between us and others is some of the most beautiful feelings we've ever had. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying I haven't been in a hectic, crowded airport and, and you know, had my emotions get the best of me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But also, if you want, you know, get perspective, there there isn't an airport in the United <laughs> States that is more hectic than an airport in a third world country you know, or anywhere else where the population is 10x, you know, and and there's no such thing as a line, you know, lines don't exist and (laughs) cues don't exist and all of that stuff. (laughs) And it it becomes a perspective where like, oh, I miss the fact that at least, you know, at the terminal here, there's, they have separated lines for group one, two, three, four. Over there, it's just a crowd and it's just elbows. And I think, I I think it's, it's important in that context, but also remembering that, you know, peace is internal. You yeah, know, it is an inside job, you know. It's an inside job. It, and exactly. and the thing is, I I recognize that if we just breathe, yes. uh, and we take in, you know, there I I go to meditation retreats in the Orcas Islands, and there's a there's a there's one called Tung Lin, um, meditation, which is mm. breathing in the pain and suffering that you sense people are having. Call it Ukraine, call it Russia, call it wherever. And then you breathe out the love and compassion, right? And it's almost like, I'm not recommending that people go do that meditation. What I'm saying is when you think about the process of what you're putting your mind into, even if you were in an airport and you just took a moment to close your eyes, I mean, a minute and breathe and put yourself into a new state of I'm not rushed. There is enough. My seat will be there. I'm going to be okay. It does shift you. It really does. Now speak with the listeners about being enough. We just talked about and not having to become uh, someone else to be loved, right? So here, somebody here, this is important. It's like, oh, I got to do something different than who I am so that I can be loved by that other person outside of myself, right? How do we just love ourselves unconditionally so we can be loved, be loved by another? Yeah, I think, as I said, I think there's this idea of enoughness. It just should not apply. You know, right. I think we, we need to abandon this idea of telling people they're enough. That just, it's not a measurement that should apply to people. Um, enough is measuring recipes and your gas tank <laughs> it's not measuring if you can't be enough of a person if you you can't be enough of a tree you can't be enough of a flower you can't be enough of a puppy there's none this this enoughness you know it needs to be abandoned and i think that that comes from consumeristic culture as well where you're meant to feel like you are inadequate as you are and you need to have some more shit to to, to feel like you're, you're something else so i think that's really important and you know but excuse of, me doesn't it also come from 
other people who've said you're not enough. I mean, hey, you didn't get straight A's. Why didn't you get straight A's? You know, you're going to school, college, whatever. In other words, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, people can actually lay on to other people that they're not enough. You didn't do a good enough job. Yeah, but uh, one thousand percent. Yeah, <laughs> right. But so, I think what that is is that's the prisoners graduating to the guards. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so what they're doing is they're still taking these concepts, and you know, and, and and again, outcomes could be enough. You know, did I get the grades to get into Harvard? You know, did right. I? You know, the outcomes could be enough. But again, those aren't a reflection of an individual. But you also said earlier about reprogramming ourselves. I mean, 1, I think we've been, look, if if my hardware, or I'm sorry, if my software that I put into the computer doesn't care, and it's like my software says I'm not enough, I'm not enough. You've got to reprogram that, yeah. right? It has to be a new software that says you're enough, you're enough, you're enough, the way you are. I'm going to go a step further and say we may also have to make peace with the fact that some of this software mm-hmm. is not going anywhere <laughs> despite our efforts you know it's like you 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 buy a phone it already comes preloaded with software and there's nothing you can do to get it off you can't delete the calculator app on your phone right. you can't do any of these things right. and i think a lot of these a lot of this software served vital purposes in our survival the need for acceptance mattered a lot when we were in small village communities uh paranoia meant meant mattered a lot when we were uh susceptible to different predators um and none of these have any uh relevance or value in these large societies that we live in and i think oftentimes that's where a lot of these challenges come from where you know your enoughness didn't matter as much Um, outside of what your community thought of you in terms of you contributing to the community when you were in a village of 100 people. And if you weren't carrying your weight or or following the rules, you might have been shunned and ostracized. And that shunning and ostracism could have led to, you know, your actual death. Now I feel like those fears remain. Um, And I think the step number one, and I think this is this is where, you know, this is my belief on it. Step number one is acknowledging, okay, I have these limiting beliefs. Um, they may be etched or tattooed into my DNA the same way software is built into a phone. Um, step one is to be aware of it. And step one is not to instantly believe it and understand that for thousands and thousands of years and hundreds of generations, this served us. But now in modern society, it, it's actually not, you know, it's a, it, it's not serving us. And I think this first step to the reprogramming, and again, I don't know if it could be completely a reprogram, or at least I I haven't witnessed an individual with a complete reprogram of it, um, is to acknowledge it and then be like, okay, I can feel these things, I can think these things, but I don't have to believe these things. You know, I I am I am the soul within. You know, witnessing this, and uh, I'm witnessing the world around me. I am experiencing emotions and I'm experiencing thoughts, but none of these are me. And I think that's a really important thing to to acknowledge from that standpoint, uh, especially when it comes to this enoughness. And also just a reminder of the people you love, genuinely that you love, that fill your heart when you think of them. You could probably write a list of all their imperfections or their flaws. And none of those flaws or imperfections disqualify them from your love. And there's also... That's true. Yeah, that is true. There's yeah. also little babies that you've held for the first time that have filled you up with love. You've had no interactions with this child. You have no idea what their personality is. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't require, you don't, you don't need five years with them to establish a relationship to love them. Love, yeah. The love has always existed, you know, and the pathways are being created between us. Uh, it's just the, the older we get and the way our society is framed for its own economic gain, Um, We feel like we have to be or do or accomplish something to gain this love when really that's just giving us a whole bunch of ego stuff. That's really going taking us further away from love. Whereas I said, love is how do you love yourself? Go easy on yourself, you know, embrace what is considered imperfect. You know, you're you're able to do that with everybody else. I, I mentioned a Beyonce video on YouTube where she falls off stage and like watch that and see if it gives you a negative impression of her. It won't, 
The only way to connect with people is to be vulnerable. Right. The only way to be vulnerable is to not be perfect. If somebody was perfect, they would be incapable of vulnerability because they have nothing to be vulnerable about. So let's embrace our imperfections, be vulnerable, because that is the only way to establish meaningful connection with other people and, and cut through this membrane of ego uh, and allow two to become one. It does, when you are aware that you are not perfect, allow you to open up to receive more love. Um, because if you are playing, I am Mr. Perfect or Mrs. Perfect, um, your expectations of what should be, because, you know, you've got a lot of attachment to that perfection. Uh, and I know when people play that perfection game, um, it often um, makes them miserable, completely miserable. Okay. I've seen it too many times. Now, humble, you grew up in the shake faith. Um How's this influenced you and how can you coexist with the ego so that we have peace um, and that we, how do you want to say it? I'm not going to say serve the ego, but it's an interesting place. I've, I've met many people from your philosophy, your religion, and you are very peaceful people. Um, you mentioned in the book that um, it's a, a, one of the largest uh, religions. And I yeah, didn't know the, that. I thought yeah. Muslim. I thought Muslim was the largest one. Well, I mean, it's top five. So I think you know. I think so. I think Hinduism is, is probably number one. Islam is number two. Christianity is probably number three. I'm not sure what number four is, but I think we're number five. Wow. I know there's there's more people of, of Sikh heritage than there are of Jewish heritage. Um, so there's more of us than, than Jewish folks. Uh, just to put a perspective in terms of numbers, um, but at the same time, we represent two percent of India. So, you know, as, as, as many tens of millions of us exist, you know, we're still only a, a drop, a drop in the pond um, of India because their population is so large. Yes. Um, I think the, the beauty of Sikh philosophy, and I, and, and I love referring to it as a philosophy more than a religion, because I, yeah, don't, yes. I like it not sounding indoctrination, like indoctrination, but um, it, it talks about your calm, krod, lo, mohankar, which is your, your lust your greed, your anger, your attachment, and your ego. And it views them as five warriors that can't be defeated, but you can that you can work with. Um, and another great analogy with the ego is, you know, the the door, you know, we've heard the mustard seed analogy of the mustard seed uh, sized door to heaven. The, the ego would be the elephant that you're sitting on. And, you know, the only way to get through the door is to get off the elephant. Mm -hmm. And recognizing that, look, this is, if I want peace, my lusts, my greed, my anger, my attachments, and my ego are the five things that I'm, I'm probably experiencing when I'm not at peace. And I think that Definitely. awareness, yeah, and I think that awareness is just really important uh, to start off. Because I think so often right now we're like oh i'm not at peace maybe i need a drink maybe i need a bigger house maybe i need more followers maybe i need a blue check mark on my social media we think we have to attain 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 and i think for for me i was very fortunate to grow up in a heritage that was like no you have to let go here are things yes. you have to let go you have to let go of these desires it's it's not the the unfulfilled desire it's the desire that is the issue Right. And let's address the desire. And also let's channel back to, to moments of your life when you didn't have these desires. So you already knew what that piece was. And so I think for me, it's really important from that standpoint. And also in the writings and the hymns, um, you know, it's very universal in the context of human nature. And, and, and one of my favorite lines is, if you want to play the game of love, come with your head in your palm. Mm. And um, it's a it's a very... Um, it's a very poignant image because in our history, you know, the 10th guru asked for physical heads at one point of his followers. He goes, I need heads. I need, I need you to give me your head. And he took, he took five gentlemen into a tent and uh, gave the impression that he beheaded them. He came out, he called for one. He got a volunteer, went into a tent, came back out with blood on his sword and said, I need another one. And uh, another volunteer came and he did this for five, five volunteers. 
and people started thinking that he was just going to cut off everybody's head. And then when he opened the tent, all five of them were dressed in new clothes. Nobody had been beheaded. Um, but, you know, and, and they became his beloved ones. And, and the analogy is a sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. It doesn't feel like sacrifice when, you're, when, when it's authentic love. But love is to give up everything. You know, freedom is having nothing to lose. You're free when there is nothing left. You can give everything, give everything away. It's not acquiring things. Um, and that quote in itself, I actually have it tattooed on my neck. Um, that was a gift from somebody who saw the tattoo on my neck. And I heard that from a survivor of the Holocaust. And she said, listen, you're free the moment you decide to be free. You don't have to achieve a freedom from anything. The moment you decide yeah, to have nothing left to lose. Well, you, you bring up an important point. I've had this discussion most recently. You know, I think it was Dr. Larry Dossey speaking, speaking before a group. And he said the way, the, the most important thing you have to remember is you have agency over yourself or free yes. choice. Yes. And, and whether it's your health or your spirituality. It's all about your choice. It's the choices you're going to make. And you have free will. You have agency to lose weight. You have agency to be a good person. You have agency to do almost anything that yeah. you want to do. And I think that's really important. And that's what you're really saying. And I want to remind our listeners, uh, How to Be Loved is the book. We're going to put a link to Amazon for this. Uh, this is Humble the Poet we're speaking with. You can go to humblethepoet.com. In our wrap-up question here, Humble, this book is filled with great wisdom, advice. It's got stories, um, stories about you, your own personal life. Um, you've compiled over 62 short, concise chapters regarding love. Um, what advice would you like to leave the listeners with about how to cultivate self-love and then uh, love others unconditionally? I would say prioritize your self-respect over your self-esteem. Self-respect is how you view yourself. Self-esteem is how other people view you. Um, so often we deny ourselves love and self-respect in the name of being likable and accepted by others. Um, self-love is saying no. Self-love is showing your teeth. Self-love is standing up for yourself. Self-love is establishing boundaries. All of these things can be scary because they can make you appear unlikable. It is more important for you to like yourself and love yourself than it is for you to gain acceptance from other people. Um, Self-love is also going easy on yourself. You have never met a critic more harsh than yourself. Um, don't fight that critic. Embrace that critic with love. Um, there's a quote in the book, don't beat yourself up for beating yourself up. And mm -hmm. I think when we have this healthier relationship with the, those inner voices that we have that are critical, and instead of being combative towards them, um, that is a great definition of going easy on ourselves. And when we go easy on ourselves, we can go easier on other people. And when we go easier on other people, we will encourage them to be more vulnerable with us because they won't feel as afraid of being judged by us. How we judge ourselves is the measurement of how we judge other people. What we don't like in ourselves is often what we don't like in other people. So this all begins with ourselves. Embrace yourself. Accept yourself as you are. If anything, go the other way. Ask yourself, what is my favorite part of my body? What is my favorite part of my personality? Celebrate yourself as is. You can have progress. You can set intentions and directions to improve your quality of life, improve your health. But don't tell yourself that you're not enough as you are. You are mm -hmm. enough. There's no enoughness again as you are. There is no enoughness. But again, you want progress. You want to eat healthier. You want to lose some weight by all means. Do all of that stuff and then celebrate the progress, but also celebrate where you are and who you are um, and honor who you are, because I think that's really important. And the healthier relationship you have with yourself, the healthier relationship you can have with everybody else around you. Well, thank you for that. I mean, it's uh, it doesn't matter what time of the year that message is valid, but in particularly this time of the year, because I think people get a little amped up and ramped up and, mm -hmm. you know, it's the mm -hmm. holiday times and they've got to make things perfect and they got to get everybody a gift and they got to go crazy. Uh, all you gotta do is go out on the streets and you can see it. <laughs> um, and again, that's part of this Western culture, which is commercialized 
uh, at something called Christmas, you know, and, and I want to say namaste to you. Thank you for being on this podcast and embracing our listeners with some great advice and wisdom. Uh, you did a great job and I'm going to encourage my listeners again. Here's the book. It's a Hay House book, uh, How to Be Loved, subtitle, Simple Truths for Going Easier on Yourself, which he just said, Embracing Imperfection and Loving Your Way to a Better Life. 62 short little chapters that provide just wonderful advice and stories about that. Humble blessings to you this holiday and season. Enjoy it. And I look forward to meeting up with you in Los Angeles when I'm up there. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, you sharing me with your audience. And I appreciate the important work that you're doing.